dropped weapons to rebels in the town of Maria in northern province of Aleppo. A rebel commander and monitoring group said ammunition was dropped. The British-based Syrian Observatory for Human Rights said weapons and ammunition were dropped as it was the first time for the coalition to drop weapons to fighters other than the Syria Democratic Forces, an alliance fighting separately against Daesh that includes the Kurdish militia. Daesh last week drove rebels, including foreign-backed groups, out of areas near the Turkish border and cut off supply lines to rebel-held Morea in a setback to groups that have been supported through Turkey. The UN World Food Programme said on Friday it had readied a plan to deliver aid by air to 19 besieged areas inside Syria, but both funding and Syrian government approval would be needed before it could be put into operation. High altitude airdrops would be viable in four areas, including Fua and Kufraya, where about 20,000 people are trapped, but the other 15 areas were in urban or semi urban areas where helicopters would be the only option. The United Nations has already been airdropping aid from high altitudes to 110,000 people besieged by Daesh militants in Deir Zor. But airdrops are a last resort as they are costly, complicated and deliver a mere trickle of aid. Iraqi forces say they are continuing to push into Daesh terrorists held city of Fallujah having secured its outskirts. Iraqi officers said that the large number of civilians in the city was slowing down the military operation because it means fewer airstrikes can be carried out. Iraqi forces are heavily dependent on airstrikes to achieve territorial victories against Daesh terrorist group. The U.S.-led coalition says that they have carried out four airstrikes against the militants' targets in and around Fallujah since Wednesday. The strikes hit fighting positions, a weapons cache, and a tunnel system. Fallujah is one of the lost militant strongholds in Iraq. The militants also hold El Mosul, the second largest city. As recite car bomber in women's clothes detonated his explosives laden vehicle near the house of the southern city of Aden's security chief wounding two people on Thursday. The security chief was unhurt by the attack which started a small fire outside the security chief's house. Yemeni police director said the early detection of the explosives by sniffer dogs prevented a larger number of casualties. The attack was the third to target the home of Major General Shalal Shia since December. Welcome back. Uh, President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi held talks with his uh, Palestinian counterpart Mahmoud Abbas to discuss a new Egyptian initiative in addition to the Paris summit itself. Um, the uh, two leaders discussed the Palestinian demand for a unified Arab front at the Paris summit and uh, they called for the Israeli withdrawal to the pre-1967 uh, line and the establishment of a Palestinian state. Uh, the uh, Paris negotiations obviously is a big thing on the news today. So let's go take a look at this report and uh, have a look at uh, the peace initiatives uh, towards the Palestinian and Israeli cause. French President François Hollande on Friday urged Israelis and the Palestinians to make a courageous choice for peace as he opened an international conference on the conflict in Paris. Hollande said a solution had to involve the whole region, but in the end it was up to the Israelis and the Palestinians. French Foreign Minister Jean-Marc Ayrault said direct talks between the two parties do not work. France has convened foreign ministers from major powers to put Israel-Palestinian peacemaking back on the international agenda and find enough common ground to bring the two sides back to the table by the end of the year. With U.S. efforts to broker a deal on a Palestinian state on Israel-occupied land in deep freeze for two years and Washington focused on its November presidential election, France has lobbied key players to hold a conference that would aim to break the apathy over the impasse and stir new diplomatic momentum.
France has grown frustrated over the absence of movement toward a two-state solution since the collapse of the last round of talks in April 2014, arguing that letting the status quo prevail is like waiting for a powder keg to explode. The gathering of ministers in Paris includes the Middle East Quartet, which comprises the United States, Russia, the European Union, and the United Nations, as well as the Arab League, the UN Security Council, and about 20 countries. Neither Israel nor the Palestinians have been invited. The meeting, the first international conference on the issue since Annapolis in the United States in 2007, does not touch on any of the chronic core differences between the two sides. Its initial focus is to reaffirm existing international texts and resolutions that are based on achieving a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza Strip with Israel and an outcome some say is becoming unrealistic. Previous attempts to coax the foes to strike a deal have come to note. The Palestinians say Israeli settlement expansion in occupied territory is dimming any prospect for the viable state they seek with a capital in Arab East Jerusalem or Al-Quds. Welcome back. Uh, that was a report on the Paris uh, Peace Initiative and the Palestinian-Israeli negotiations. Uh, president Abdel Fattah had met with the visiting Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas, who was in Cairo attending an extraordinary meeting for the Arab League uh, following the recent introduction of an Egyptian initiative for uh, the Palestinian-Israeli peace talks, alongside, obviously, the French initiative uh, that uh, have been stalled by Americans and by the Israelis as well. Um, but according to the President, he had said said or told the Palestinian president that uh, the Palestinian cause is on the top of the agenda of the foreign policy of Egypt. Um, we're joined right now with Dr. Ibrahim Hassan El Ghazawi, an international relations expert. Good afternoon to you, sir. Good afternoon. Um, could you tell us about, uh, yeah, what do you think of the meeting between President Abdel Fattah Sisi and Mahmoud Abbas? Um, well, it's um, a reflection of the ever-going uh, uh, communication between the two leaders, mm -hmm. the, the Egyptian leader and, and the Palestinian leader. Mm -hmm. But it comes today in a very sensitive time yes. uh, for, for Palestinians, for the Palestinian cause itself. We all know what, what is going on in the Middle East uh, region. Yes. And uh, if, if I may say it, uh, most of the uh, disturbances and the problems that take place today in the region came at the account uh, of the Palestinian cause, negatively. Yes. Um, we have to understand that the, um, the only uh, winner of, of what is going on in the Middle East today is Israeli side. Mm -hmm. And um, the most loser is the Palestinian side because the Palestinian cause today is weaker than ever. Um, that's why I see this meeting today between the President uh, Sisi and, and uh, President Abbas uh, as a, a trial to revive the, the, the cause itself and put it again in the facade of events. Of course, alongside with Paris uh, conference, uh, which is very important indeed. It came at a time where a lot of, pe a lot of people in the region, even inside the region, mm -hmm. they nearly forgot the Palestinian cause, which is really disastrous. You know? But with, with, as you said, with the threat of Daesh, for instance, in Syria and Iraq, and obviously there is civil war in Syria happening and uh, civil strife as well in Yemen, um, where does the Palestinian cause play into all of this? How can the Arab League handle all of these conflicts at the same time? Well, that's really uh, uh, very confusing and perplexing. And I don't find uh, a lot of answers to a lot of questions indeed. Um, w one of the main uh, question marks about uh, ISIS itself, yes. uh, why did it appear today? Uh, who is behind it? Mm -hmm. And who is behind this uh, uh, massive expansion uh, suddenly? And it came all of a sudden from the unknown. And all of a sudden we found a lot of uh, Arab communities facing this enormous, uh, enormous power. Yes. Uh, as if it has been there for years and years, but hidden somewhere. Yes. Um, who is behind that? And who is, well, probably the answer will be answering other question. Who is benefiting from the, this presence of ISIS and other groups alike? Mm -hmm. 
that takes us back to the origin of the issues, the Palestinian cause and the Israeli side. And I have to say today that uh, probably we didn't discover it so far, but today it became like, uh, uh, you know, water clear fact yes. that, the, that Israeli uh, interests are orchestrating the life in the Arab world. We have to accept this. It's, it's a really sad fact, but, yes. but we cannot deny it. Yes. What happened in Syria, what happened in Iraq, what happened in Yemen, what happened in Libya, in, in other Arab countries, this state of uh, uh, disintegration that takes place from, from a place to another in the Arab region, the only uh, beneficiary yes. is Israel. Yes. Um, that's why I look into Paris' attempt, the French uh, trial to revive the Palestinian cause again in a, in a positive way. But obviously there is a lot of stalling happening, especially with like, uh, for instance, the Secretary of State of the U.S., John Kerry, he has postponed his arrival there several times. Do you think this is an intentional way of trying to disintegrate the, the negotiations of the Paris summit? Well, I, well, it's, um, well, I don't find any other uh, answer to this. I mean, th this is the only possible logic one. Uh, for, for several reasons, indeed. One of them is the United States is uh, the key player mm -hmm. in the international politics. And when it comes to the Middle East, it's not only the key player, but the most influential and important player. So I don't think they will accept or relinquish suddenly that their influence uh, be limited by the French. So this they is don't want the French to be handling this? Yeah, of course they wouldn't say that. Yes. But practically, we should ex expect this to happen. Uh, from the other side, uh, we, we understand the, 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 this strong and uh, unbreakable relations between Israel and the United States. And by the way, unbreakable is not my term. It's Barack Obama's term, yes. and he said it in Egypt in 2008 in, in, uh, in Cairo University. So he said the American-Israeli bonds are unbreakable. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the American president's statement is very indicative. It means that the support of America to Israel is unconditional yes. and continuous. And we have to accept that. And we have to deal with the, the Palestinian cause with Israelis from this take-off point. There is no time today or in future when we might think that uh, the American uh, stance towards the cause will be uh, fully supporting Palestinians against Israelis. That will not happen. Um, from the other side, we also should expect and push for uh, at least just an acceptable solution for the cause itself. And let me tell you honestly that um, if we keep the cause the way it was, I mean, Palestinians are, are, uh, are dreaming of uh, taking all their land and Israelis are sticking to what they have at their hand and, and none of them is really willing to... Uh, relinquish some of his of their demands. Yes. This will never lead to any solution. Yes. So a peaceful solution means simply that we need to make sort of compromise yes. approach. This this should happen today instead of tomorrow. But what about I mean the peace initiative or the summit, the French summit, inc involves some sort of negotiations where uh, there are powers or world powers gathering to negotiate uh, for the Palestinians and Israelis, but they're not actually playing a real role in the negotiation mm -hmm. process itself. How could that actually work when the two parties involved are not really major players in it? Well, that's another issue. I mean, we have to think about it. Um, I think that about 30 states uh, were, uh, you know, in, in the summit, on the, the mm -hmm. foreign ministers' uh, uh, summit yesterday. And yes, and I, I see positively that, you know, the way they handled the, the cause and the last statement of the conference was very positive. They expressed uh, the uh, reassured the the uh, the two-state solution, and expressed all the concerns about the settlement process and this continuous, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in delivering or or, or 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 eating of the Palestinian land day after day, uh, which makes uh, the, the the resolution for the causes even more resilient and more difficult yes. in future. So the outcome of the, the, the Paris conference is not bad. I mean, yes, it's good. But the other question is, um, are, is this outcome going to be applied on the ground? This, this is a very exactly. important issue. 
how America, the United States of America, and uh, the other side of the issue, and the main side of the issue, Israel, how they are going to do that. We have to follow the last day's statement coming from Israeli side, and most of them are very uh, uh, pessimistic about, yes. about the conference. They refused it, and they said they don't pay uh, much attention to it, and they are, they are of the conviction that the only way to resolve the issues with Palestinians is direct negotiations with Palestinians themselves. That takes us to the zero point. Yes. But the Palestinians have some sort of momentum relatively compared to, you know, the past, where there have been Western countries, or at least parliaments in Western countries, that have recognized a Palestinian state. So this is a positive step, and I suppose it is something that gives the Palestinian cause a bit of a, 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 a bit of power when it comes to discussions and negotiations. Well, it's... Um I, um I might not agree totally with you on that. Yes, it's sort of power, but it's... Uh, does it not sort it's, of it's, it's not um, materialized power. It's, yes. it's sort of abstract power that doesn't translate into real effect on the ground. Yes. That's the main issue. And indeed, there are a lot of uh, things alike in, uh, over the history, the long history of the Palestinian cause with the Israelis. With a lot of support. But, but all of them, they have gone in vain without, yes. without you know, tangible changes on the ground or real... Um, force or power to make pressure on Israel to change the reality. Um, that takes us back to the, the take-off point of the cause itself. Who are the main key players of the cause? Uh, of course, we talk about Israelis and Palestinians. Mm. Israelis today are stronger than ever. Mm. Palestinians today are weaker than ever. Weaker because they are divided. Yes. This is a really sad fact. And if they are divided, simply, this will postpone any real uh, tackling uh, for the cause itself. Because if the people mainly concerned with the, the, the pain and the suffering of the cause, if the people who are mainly concerned with that are not paying attention and divided amongst themselves, that doesn't give serious appearance to their demands, to, uh, not only before Israelis or Americans, but also before the international community. But the Israelis have actually, their, their hands are in this sort of divide between the Palestinians. They have really caused a rift between them. So what? I mean, what, what is new about that? Yes. This is understood. And if, if Israelis don't do that, I mean, this, is, this will be illogic, you know? But you think that the PLO But Palestinians would, have yeah. to pay attention, not to get trapped into this for a long time. I mean, if the, the main people concerned with the solution itself, mm -hmm. they are not, you know, united in one front, yes. how can other people will support them? Which side will support? Who is going to represent Palestinians in the conference? And if Israeli side said, okay, which, which side of the Palestinians will be talking in the name of Palestinians? Who will say, yes, I'm here? Yes. Uh, Gaza or... or, uh, or uh, uh, or Western Bank. So we are, we are uh, um, in front of a real dilemma on the ground. The Palestinians themselves, they don't recognize the, the, the significance of the plight they put themselves in by being divided so far today. And if we may remember today Yasser Arafat, the late Yasser Arafat days, uh, the, there was no time when the, the Palestinians were divided. Yes. They were all one hand, one voice. And, uh, um, and we have to appreciate this for Yasser Arafat and, and his time. Today, we have this sort of division. This sort of division will cut from the, 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 uh, the support, and so I, w w w the, the, this support, whether it's uh, material or, or, or ethical or psychological to the Palestinian cause, because simply you say, okay, if, you're, if your people are not you know, strong together in one hand, how do you expect me to help you? Which sides I will go for? And uh, of course, there are some allegations from both sides, you know. Both of them are accusing each other of betraying the Palestinian cause. Yeah. So this is not acceptable. The takeoff point is that they have to be one voice. But there was, there was at some point, talks of a, a unity sort of government to handle the situation with, uh, with the Israeli negotiations and so forth. Is this a possibility, or is it, could it be something of a reality? I know there's a lot of bickering between the, the, the Gaza Strip, Hamas, and uh, uh, the PLO in the West Bank. 
can they sort of unify their fronts? I'm afraid they don't have uh, alternatives. I mean, even if it looks difficult for them, and I actually I don't find why it is difficult so far, if they are one people, if they are one, uh, one race, one Palestinian, and they have one cause, and they have one enemy, and they have the same suffering, and they have the same everything, I don't find real reasons for this division. Yeah. The only reason for division is that they both seek uh, uh, limited benefits behind the cause itself, yes. which is not acceptable today. I mean, I cannot blame the world. I cannot blame even Israelis. Yes. Because the, this prolonged process of handling the demands of, of resolution for the cause itself, uh, if the Palestinians are divided among each other. That's why uh, probably... Uh, I, I, I think that well, this could be one of the topics, uh, you know, discussed between President Sisi and President uh, Abbas. It has been, oh, by the way, a, a repeated topic yes. and, and pressure always coming from Egypt because Egypt, we know exactly that th there won't be um, uh, influential handling of the problem in Palestine without Palestinians being united in yes. one front. This, this is taken for granted. We should not argue about that. Do you think that the Egyptian peace initiative, other than the fact that obviously they're going to be pushing for some sort of unity between the two powers in Palestine, um, how, what do you think the initiative will involve and how is it going to be different from the uh, France summit? Well, I think one of the different issues, you know, probably coming from Egypt is that Egypt itself has been the most, uh, you know, um, uh, obstinate enemy for Israel for a long time. We fought long wars with Israel. But we also tasted uh, peace with Israel. So we recognize what war means, and we also recognize what peace means. Yes. For, for the issue coming from Egypt, uh, Egypt is a reliable power in the region, and Egypt is, is fully committed in, in terms of our international commitment, our, our uh, uh, you know, the, the treaties and uh, conferences, or any international uh, commitment or pledges that Egypt paid one day, mm -hmm. We always full, uh, uh, you know, fully respect these obligations. So for this coming from Egypt, it's, it's a, a reliable, not only from Palestinians, but also from Israelis, which is very influential. So you think that Egypt does hold some sort of influence on, on or at least is able to discuss terms somewhat with the Israelis? Uh, yes, I think yes. I, I, I think yes, because Israelis today recognize, you know, probably more than ever, that Egypt is the, a, a real support for, for their cause, because Egypt has never been seeking temporary interests with the dealing with Palestinians or the Israeli cause. Uh, and we have to remember, and, re and remember in a very good way, uh, our late President Anwar al-Sadat, who put the Palestinian cause on the facade of negotiation with Israelis, should is Palestinians accepted to sit down in, in Mina House negotiation table with Egyptians at that time, today you could be talking about a Palestinian state fully fledging and, and independent. But they didn't, they didn't read the history and they didn't read also the future. Today, after probably over 30 or 35 years of the, the Camp David agreement, the historical one, what Israeli is offering today in, in peace, uh, negotiation with Palestinians is, is much less than 20% of what was offered before. Mm. That means simply that this time-consuming tactics played by Israelis is, is really meant to diminish what should be given in the future mm -hmm. in return for any peace agreement. Yes. Uh, is this a, a new fact? No, this is not new fact, by the way. It, this is very old. And this, very ancient, yes. but we didn't read it. Yes. We didn't understand it. But we, today we should. I mean, how long we needed to, to absorb and understand these facts. Yes. Israelis are the, the first beneficiaries behind the, the, this late handling of the Palestinian cause. Time for Israelis mean less, less land, yes. mean more power. Yes. From the other hand, time for Arabs mean weaker entities, more divided entities, and less ability to handle peace talks. But the question here is, I mean, obviously Daesh is not just a threat to Arab countries, it is also posing a threat to the Israelis. For, for much, from much, well, I, I don't agree with that. I mean, Israelis are limited in geography, 
and they have enough um, uh, power to protect their, their borders. But can they, you know, protect themselves from the inside and the outside, from Daesh threat that, and that's, the That's what they say and what they do, by the way. Yes. But, but Daesh today, in, in, they are not in Israel. Yes. But it's very good cause for Israelis even to get their armies uh, and their, their defenses stronger and stronger. So, but le le let us be more uh, realistic and practical in evaluating the situation on the region, ground. Yes. Daesh today in Syria, what they do. And the, the, today in Iraq, what they do. And today in, in, in Libya, they started already their uh, activities in Libya probably six or eight months ago. Yes. Creating powerful presence there. What they do is simply dividing and disintegrating Arab communities. They don't do any harm to Israelis, by the way. Mm -hmm. And Israel is very far from the, the shots of ISIS. And they know that, they understand it. Uh, so Daesh is only uh, weak, weakening Arab world. Mm -hmm. Why does Daesh weakening Arab world? This is the question, who is behind that? Yes. And uh, what is the effect of, of ISIS today, so far? In Syria, in in in, uh, in Yemen, in, um, in in Iraq mainly, yes. what is the effect? The effect is the weakening of armies, the disintegration of communities, more divided communities, m weaker state circles, yes. less able to handle uh, 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 internal problems. This is the outcome, and this outcome is really awful, and it's very positive and pleasant for Israeli side. What time will mean, or, you know, surrounding this, this circumstances, yes. what time will mean, will mean more profits for Israelis and more loss for Arabs. This is a fact. Uh, Netanyahu has spoke several times about, uh, obviously, uh, negotiations and peace negotiations and so forth. Obviously, they're not very serious. But with him appointing uh, Avigdor Lieberman as the Minister of Defense, how can anyone take them seriously when you have one of the most fascist people known, Israeli people known, uh, holding a position in government? Well, that, well it, it didn't come as a surprise for me, Avigdor Lieberman or else. I mean, you know, uh, 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 Prime Minister Netanyahu, that has been always like that, but so fanatic in his choices. But Lieberman is beyond fanatic. Of course, He's of very... course. Of course, I mean, I mean, yes. The uh, 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 Avigdor Lieberman is 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 a reflection. Man. Yeah, he's he's not controversial. He's a clear-cut fanatic man, yes. Yes. and uh, and such man being in defense ministry or or in the army uh, head, uh, is there a message? It's mm -hmm. a message mm -hmm. that that the army will be in full alert and the Israeli army will be more aggressive than it was before. Then this why is a are message. About peace and negotiations? Well, that's well, that's one issue. But th this this message is should be forwarded to Palestinians, to Arab leaders, uh, and I wouldn't say to the international community. The international community simply, I cannot blame them. You know, if if we Arabs are not doing what we have to do, how can I blame uh, superpower? Yes. I mean, how can you blame uh, United Kingdom or France or Russia or even United States? If we as Arabs are not united in, in terms of, you know, how to handle our main crisis. Yes. So what I say here usually is if I'm not as, as Arab community and Arab um, leading or decision making level community, if, yes. if we are not um, united into what to do and how to do it and, and when to do it in the critical time to start to do this, if we are not clear about that, I can't blame the others, yes. because uh, for how long should I, as Arab world, be depending on foreign powers to come and to resolve my problems? Yes. And I'm just sitting pretty, you know. This yes. is not acceptable. And we and we don't lack power, by the way. We have all the the, the needed power for for making real changes on the ground. But unfortunately, we don't utilize these powers. We have the power of um, population. We have the power of uh, natural resources. We have the power of oil, and but we have is, the power of the geography. Of colonialism. I mean, this is the problem with African countries, not just the Arab world, that, that mm. they seem to be divided mm. and conquered. This is how colonialism actually works. Yeah, well, the question is, yes, if, even if this is partially fact in Africa, yes. but it's, it's fully harsh fact in the Arab world because it's, it's uh, you know, 
amalgamated with some other problems like like uh, um, uh, 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 the dogmatic uh, uh, disagreements or clashes between Sunnis and Shias. This wasn't true it as wasn't, well. It as wasn't. As it few wasn't. Back. Yeah, exactly. So this is a new creation of our recent era yeah. and a lot of new challenges and devastating challenges. Uh, for, for also the other question is who is the beneficiary behind the clashes between Sunnis and Shias? Yes. Who is, who is, who is making uh, uh, benefits behind that? Mm. Um, and even within the same Arab country like Bahrain, like uh, Kuwait, like uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, most of the Gulf countries, they have both races living together for decades and decades. And Why fine. today, you know, it became so sizzling issue, yeah. this, this uh, religious one. Mm. As if they have forgotten that they both under Islam, they both under Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they both under the same, uh, uh, you know, basic uh, 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 rules for, for the same religion, and, and, and they both speak the same language and living on the same ground. So really, it's, it's really confusing in this world, in this spot, hot spot of the world in the Arab region. We need today to review yes. our stances. And, and under these challenges from inside and outside, we need to revive, to revive our main causes and put them in, 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 in a very genuine and honest way in the top of our events, our priorities, yes. with the Palestinian cause, of course, on top of them. Um, do you think that Egypt um, could play a role, because now they have a non-permanent seat in the Security Council, for pushing forward uh, resolutions, maybe helping the, the Palestinian cause? Well, to some extent, yes. Yes, yes. But, but we don't have also to be so optimistic about how far, mm. how influential. Yeah. We, we should not uh, forget that the Security Council itself has, power with has five yeah. permanent power, yes. and one of them is... is uh, you know, Vita very Power dominant, is, is very dominant, which is United States, and other four permanent powers, um, they wouldn't go against United States. Mm. And we talk about Israel presence uh, in, in the Western world, and, uh, and if, if, so, so I, I say that not because I'm pessimistic, but I don't want to, to uh, make Egypt as a member of the Security Council today uh, to overload the Egyptian side with, with a lot of dreams, yeah. that will never happen. Yeah. We have to be realistic. The, 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 the keys for solution in the, in the Middle East problems at the Israeli side, Palestinian side, American side mainly. Yes. Supportive is Egypt, supportive is Saudi Arabia, supportive is France, supportive is international community. Yeah. But the two, the three main uh, key players, yes. Israel, Palestinians, United States. So if Palestinians are divided today, Israelis are not so uh, enthusiastic to make solutions, United States is just looking from, from far yeah. away from the cause itself. And of course, they are getting into the new uh, the presidential uh, election era. And that means an, another year we have to wait until politically the uh, United States, the new president administration, could be able even to talk about Palestinian cause. Yes. It means that we have to wait another year because we rely on the United States for a long time. Uh, the alternative is us as, as Arab world. As I said before, if we make sort of stance mm -hmm. in the Arabic world, and if we support the Palestinian cause in our own way, mm -hmm. uh, using our own resources, but before that, if, if Palestinians become, on, become again one, this is the main take-off point, Palestinians should become one again, because today they are not one, they are many. And, uh, and uh, since they are many, since they are Fatah, they are Hamas, they are Gaza, uh, so, 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 I mean, th that's not going to lead to any positive uh, end. Of course, this will deepen the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the loss of the cause itself over the time. Palestinians should be again one entity. There is no other alternative. Followed by that, Arab world, we have to support this. We have to, to go all in the same direction, simply because if we don't um, fan and encourage our national security, our Arab national security concept today, we are losing a lot. Mm -hmm. We should not forget that we have three mo major Arab uh, powers today. They, are, they have collapsed already. Syria, Iraq, 
Yemen and Libya, four yes. countries, yes. four big countries. And it means simply that you know, the time for us means loss. It doesn't mean any positive impact. Will that continue for another five years where we might find in the future another three or other four or five Arab countries disappearing again? Yes. That's not wisdom. We should not wait for that. But, but the Arab countries have relatively understood this message and, and the countries that have not been touched so much by Daesh are trying to sort of unify themselves, like Egypt uh, the, and some of the GCC countries, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, they're somewhat trying to unify themselves. It, it's still so far individual uh, efforts. I wouldn't say um, um, popular ones. Yes. I mean, it has to be unified. It has to be sort of fronts, mm -hmm. uh, a, a sort of allies. I mean, today uh, the, uh, the presence is for power, and power means the assembly, the congregation of people, resources, uh, efforts, uh, effort, efforts and, and also powers. We talk about armies, we talk about... Today, um, uh, we have to be honest. Who have the last word in anything? The, the powerful or the weak? Yes. The powerful. Yes. So what, what does powerful mean? It, it means simply, it means army, it means uh, money, financing, yes. it means uh, po people themselves, and it means also the concept of unity that collect all of this yes. together in one entity. Without this, I, I'm, I'm afraid we wouldn't make any uh, positive change in the future. But do you think that, the, for instance, the Palestinian-Israeli uh, negotiations, how could that work when the Israelis uh, uh, keep building settlements, new settlements? We're talking about um, the pre-1967 line. Well, on this line, there's a lot of settlements that have been exactly. built since then. How do you expect that the Israelis will remove these settlers? And then? Well, this is very um, blatant um, uh, violation of international law from one side, and also violation of um, the previous agreements and previous commitments also by, by Israelis in, in previous agreements, even with, with Palestinians. Um, but it's a fact. But it's still fact. I mean, yes. Israel has been always like that. This is new, not new for Israelis. I mean, breaking the law is, is their basic uh, uh, life role as, as a state itself. I'm, I'm very sad to say that, but this is a state that was built itself over the violations of international law and human rights law. So how far would I go in blaming Israel? I can't blame them any more than blaming Palestinians for being divided, yes. for being not caring about their own problems. Israelis build settlements because they don't find someone in, in their way to tell them no, you have to yes. stop. Who will tell them no? Palestinians? They don't find time to tell Israelis no because they fight each other. Yes. So we have to accept that. I mean, we have to change this reality. Yes. Accept it as a sad fact, but, but should change it. Well, unfortunately, sir, we ran out of time for this episode. Dr. Ibrahim Hassan El Ghazawi, an international relations expert, thank you so much for joining thank us this so afternoon. Thank you so much. This brings us to the end of this episode of Arab Affairs, but stay tuned for more on Nile TV.